Speed inspiration four. Copy, one alpha. Vehicles pitching downrange. The scene, eight o'clock last night, Cape Canaveral, Florida, as inspiration four, the mission heads toward, well, heads into orbit. The first ever all civilian crew on board. There's some scenes from inside the capsule, a billionaire entrepreneur who paid for the whole thing, along with three other amateur astronauts, as they're called, riding along Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket, the first trip for his space tourism company. They're going to be in space for three days and then splash down in the Atlantic. But because this is such a remarkable occurrence, a first, all civilian, you know we had to get the perspective of our friend Bob McDonald, the host of Quirks and Quarks, <laughs> who's up super early for us in Victoria, B.C. Good morning. Good morning, Heather. So first, how remarkable to your sense? <laughs> I think this is very remarkable, Heather, because it showed that the private sector has truly taken over sending people into space. SpaceX got it right. The launch went off exactly on time. The rocket booster was recycled. It flown in space before. The capsule that they were riding in has flown in space before, which made this flight far, far cheaper than the former space shuttles that NASA was flying. The training of these civilians happened in five months, and it was done without NASA's help at all. So this is showing that the private sector can now take over putting people in space and bringing them back. And I, I equate this with what happened uh, in at the end of World War II when companies like Boeing were hired by the government to develop big four-engine bombers for the war effort. Then when the war ended, Boeing took that same technology and turned them into airliners. And at first, only rich people could fly. But the industry took off and the private sector is now making you know flight available for almost everyone. So this is the beginning of that, where, where the private private sector is saying, okay, uh, anyone who can afford it, and right now it's billionaires because it's a lot, but, you know, industry, scientists, NASA itself is now just a, a client of SpaceX. So it's, it is it is the beginning of true commercial space flight. I think that's remarkable. It's so interesting to hear because it's, it's a different one than some of the things that I've been thinking about. But I want to ask, you mentioned the training, which is mm -hmm. several months long for this group. Uh, and they're not like green thumbs totally. One of them, I, I've been looking at their bio, trained pilot, one's ex-Air Force. Right. But they are all amateur astronauts. That's how they're being billed. I mean, can they do this job in these three days? I mean, what are their challenges oh. they're going to face? Well, yes, they can, because the uh, Dragon capsule is pretty well totally automated. Those same capsules are used to bring cargo up to the space station with no one on them at all, and they can fly themselves, they can dock with the space station. So most of their training was what to do if something goes wrong and uh, how to get out and how to guide the thing down if need be. So their training was um, uh, more survival training, and yeah, the, the capsule's designed, so it's it's like the self-driving cars, the self-driving Tesla of space. And uh, so that's that's, that's good. That's what you want. That's what you want so that anyone can go up. And uh, their challenge from this point is uh, after they get over the giddiness of living in that tiny little capsule with four people, looking out the remarkable dome that they have at the top, they're so high they're going to get an incredible view of the earth. And then on Saturday they have to splash down. And that's going to be uh, quite hard on their bodies. They're going to fall from space like a meteor. Uh, they'll experience about six times their weight as the outside of the capsule gets up to several thousand degrees, then that pop of the parachutes coming open will jar them again, and then they splash down in the ocean and float along on the waves, hopefully not getting sick. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be their big thing is splashing down on Saturday. But uh, it's uh, if, if all goes well, this is the beginning of a, a different kind of air in space where it's now, it's now commercial and cheaper than the way it was done in the past with the government. So I can see there are benefits in that. But you said something interesting. Anyone can go up. Every time you and I have talked about astronauts, over these years, you know, they, they are, you know, they're mythical in, in society. We admire them so much. They're incredibly brilliant and accomplished. They train for years. Mm -hmm. When you can win a seat in a sweepstakes or when you can train for a couple of months and then go up, I mean, does it remove some of the magic or, or, or the luster <laughs> to all of this? Oh, I don't think so. I think these people are thought of uh, very highly because they have gone from being regular civilians. I mean, one of them is a is a cancer survivor. Uh, she's only, what, 28 years old? She's the youngest, I think, the youngest person to fly in space. No training whatsoever. Didn't even know much about space. And she went from that to an astronaut in uh, in half a year, less than half a year. I think that's astounding. And uh, it means, Heather, that you and I now have a better chance. Not, not, you know, not big, but a better chance of getting in. All we need is a friend billionaire who can pay for the ticket to get us 
up there. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes it more accessible. Okay, I wanted to hear your view on that. Bob, thank you so much as always. Great to see you. We'll be listening. Always a pleasure, Heather. Bob McDonald, your host of Quirks and Quarks.